Well, I have um, the great honor and privilege to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Pat Mulroy is the general manager of the Southern Nevada Water Authority and the Las Vegas Valley Water District. She's currently president of the Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies, and she's the first Nevadan and the first woman to hold this position. And she's on the board of directors for the National Water Resources Association and is also on the board of trustees for the Water Research Foundation. She's very active within the Las Vegas community and has participated in a number of documentaries about the southwestern U.S. water issues. So she's going to come up here today and talk to us about what she's facing as a general manager for one of the very large metropolitan areas here in the southwest. Pat? Well, good morning, everyone. It's a sheer delight for me to be able to come to UNLV, my alma mater, and um, talk to you today. And it's particularly um, a delight for me to follow my hero, Kelly Redman, um, to, who, from, in my mind, is one of the great climate scientists uh, in the United States. And Kelly, my hat's off to you, and um, thank you for all you do for Nevada. Uh, I thought that what I would talk about here today is bring you down to Earth, back down to how it's actually beginning to show its effects amongst those of us responsible for delivering water to millions of people. And I'm particularly delighted that over the last several years we thankfully have decided to leave the debate over the religion of climate change um, outside the door and begin to look at it in a much more realistic and pragmatic way. I'll never forget when I was asked to deliver the keynote speech at the Water Research Foundation and I did talked about climate change and the challenges that climate change was going to present to the water community. After that, I was told that the state, the re delegation from the state of Oklahoma had informed the Research Foundation that they would quit the Research Foundation if there was another discussion of climate change. And I thought to myself, well, this is going to go well. <laughs> Back in 2007, there were several of us large municipal agencies that began to see exactly how dramatic and impactful climate change was going to be on our service areas. And this was right during the time when we were still arguing about whether Al Gore should have gotten an um, Oscar for the inconvenient truth. And the seven of us, and we were a diverse mix, yeah, a lot of us were from the West, decided that it was time for us to stand up, come together, form an organization that would go to Congress and would begin to rattle some old misperceptions. We had Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, San Diego, Denver, New York City, and ourselves. Each of us was going to be impacted by climate change in a very different way, but we each saw it as probably the one thing that was keeping us up at night. There is no place that has seen a more dramatic impact from climate change than right here in Southern Nevada. And it's all about where we're located, what the source of our water supply is, and the early signs of what we're going to have to live with for the ne next 50, 60, 70, 80 years. Oftentimes, when, after I've spoken, people will ask me the uncomfortable question of when is it out there in the future that you see Las Vegas being the first large metropolitan area that folds its tent 
and there is a massive outmigration, the likes of which the planet's never seen before. And I laugh and I say, you know what, if that happens, we have no one to blame but ourselves. Where the energy industry is very intensely and uh, loudly discussing how to mitigate the human effects that are causing climate change, we in the water industry are on the front line of feeling the impacts of climate change and have to be on the front line of adapting. Las Vegas' story is one that everyone wants to hear because we've been through a journey that has taught us that climate change is at its foundation also a societal change. There are two things colliding, and it's not just here in Las Vegas. We have a burgeoning global population, and we have a shifting climate that is changing the way we experience precipitation or don't experience precipitation, the manner in which it fell, the infrastructure that we built and maintain under very different climate conditions, water quality standards that are very, very different on a going forward basis than what we've experienced in the past. Regulatory bodies that don't know how to grapple with those changes in water quality. And how do they allow urban areas to be adaptable and flexible? And for every community, it has to very carefully assess where it is in this climate dynamic, find its partners and neighbors and compatriots, and together forge a new future. In Southern Nevada, it is a mosaic. Everyone wants that one silver bullet solution. The days of that one silver bullet solution where we built Hoover Dam and Glen Canyon Dam and thousands of miles of infrastructure as being the one and only solution are long over. And we're an industry that for 40, 50, 60 years was very parental in its relationship with our customers. We knew best and we we'll, we'll take care of you, don't worry about it. You have no role in the overall management of the, of the water infrastructure and the water supply for your community. That's gone. The responsibility started at an individual level. They moved to the community level. They moved to the regional level. And finally, they moved to the national and international level. At the individual level, we in this country are the most voracious users of water resources anywhere in the world. People everywhere else are amazed at our per capita consumptions, at the standard of living that we've been able to forge. Why? Because we could. Now we have to change entire society's way of looking at consumption, both on the food side and on the water side. Because if water is changing, it will have a direct and dramatic impact on the planet's food supply as well. And we oftentimes forget that. So conservation is first and foremost. That's why this community embarked on the aggressive conservation plan that we've, the journey in which we've been on for so long. That's why we take great pride in being able to say, we started as the country's great example of water waste and today can proudly say that this community, its water footprint, our demand on that river on a net basis is 75 gallons per person per day for residential use. That's a phenomenal accomplishment for the driest city in the United States. But it is foundational. You cannot continue to develop the kind of water resources given the dramatic increases in demand on that resource that are occurring 
in this country and around the world without changing how you use it. That journey will be forever with us, but it has had and put Southern Nevada in a very good position because it gets us right in to our regional relationships because that's where the challenge really rests. We in the West come from a culture where fighting over water resources is in our DNA. I am sick and tired of Mark Twain's quote. You know, whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting. There's no purpose accomplished, no court system or judicial system nimble enough to be able to get the West through the impacts of climate change if we choose to go that route. For the last 20 years, there has been a phenomenal metamorphosis on the Colorado River in terms of the interpolitical workings between the states. Now let's look at what the Colorado River Basin really represents. We've plumbed it in all directions. It leaves the basin to Cheyenne. It leaves the basin, crosses the Continental Divide to the Front Range of Colorado, to all the large cities in that state. It leaves the basin and crosses the Utah Desert to the Wasatch Front, to Salt Lake, Provo, Orem. It leaves the basin, travels to the Rio watershed, to Albuquerque. It leaves the basin and travels to the inland cities of Arizona, to where Phoenix, Scottsdale, and even as far south as Tucson are heavily reliant on that resource. It leaves the basin and goes to the coastal cities of California, serving everyone from Santa Barbara down to San Diego. It represents 27% of the country's GDP. And over the last several years, over the last two decades, we've come to realize that you can't poke at any one end of this system without the dominoes and the effects being felt throughout the basin. What happens in Los Angeles matters in Denver. What happens in Albuquerque matters in Phoenix. We are inextricably linked. In 1922, during the years of largesse, when science only gave us a 50-year re rearview mirror to divide waters, and those unfortunately were 50 of the highest flow years, we created some pretty rigid silos in allocation and signed a compact approved by every legislature, signed by every governor, ratified by Congress, and signed by the president. Not a document easily undone. And in that document, we set the stage for the difficulties we were going to face in the 90s and the early part of this century. Because we were coming up against the limits and the realization that what we thought we had, we didn't have. In the year 2000, having gone through the 90s, discussing surpluses on the Colorado River, that's what started it. Southern Nevada was the burr in every other state's side. We were running out of water resources. Bruce Babbitt had become Secretary of Interior. He'd made a commitment to the governor of Nevada that he was going to fix Southern Nevada's water problem by making additional Colorado River water available to us. So he spent eight years of his secretarial career during the entire Clinton administration making that come about. And in 99, we signed a surplus agreement. During that process, I often sat down with him and said, Mr. Secretary, we got to talk about shortages. That's what drives this, not surpluses. And he was right when he said to me, Pat, we're not ready. 
But what happened during those years, and this is what's so key, the relationship between the states changed. We created a platform. We got to know each other. We got to understand each other's issues. The silos began to break down. So in 2000, we took a resource plan to our board, and we have to do a resource plan every single year looking 50 years out. So it's a rolling 50 years every single year so that we can adapt and we can change. In 2000, we took a resource plan that said we have 50 years of reliable resources from the Colorado River because we could overuse Lake Mead. We had our first banking arrangement with the state of Arizona. We were in great shape. In 2002, we went from having 50 years of resource to having nothing. We were fully using our allocation, beginning to overuse. We were at 320,000 acre feet. Lake Mead dropped below the level at which we could take additional resources. The state of Arizona put us on notice that the bank could not bank any water on our behalf because the cities in the state of Arizona were being ravaged by drought in the state of Arizona themselves, and there was a reliance on that bank there. There was no additional water for Nevada. Now imagine that you're responsible for water to two million people. Imagine that you have to develop a resource plan every year looking 50 years out and that that document has become all important economically, not only to Southern Nevada, but also to the state in, as a whole. Our resource plan is attached to every single bond offering for the state of Nevada and for Southern Nevada. It is attached to every SEC filing for every corporation in Southern Nevada. That resource plan cannot show a hole. No one's going to lend money to the state of Nevada. No one's going to lend money, either to a public agency or to a private group, if that resource plan doesn't show a reliable 50 years supply. The street has recognized that one of Nevada's three vulnerabilities, top three vulnerabilities, is water supply. And they look to that when they decide whether they'll invest, and if they invest, at what interest rate will they invest. So it makes a difference to every citizen in the state of Nevada, because it hits their pocketbook at the end of the day. And this resource plan was empty. There was an enormous hole in it. It wasn't as if it was five or 10 years out. Oh no, we were overusing already. We were dipping into that surplus. Now imagine making that course correction. I still vividly remember sitting around with staff. We were all very pale, looking at how we were going to move forward. And we'd always recognized that the future was a mosaic. That mosaic had to be brought to life pretty quickly. We had done one thing very right when we forged the Southern Nevada Water Authority. We'd thrown away our prior appropriative rights and said they make absolutely no sense amongst urban agencies in Southern Nevada. I know they're sacred and holy, but step back for a minute and look at them. The only time a prior appropriative right does you any good is in times of shortage. And what does it do? It says, Mr. Jones's survival is more important than Mr. Smith's. Mr. Jones gets to keep all the water he's been using all along and Mr. Jones gets nothing. If I have a shortage, the easiest way to get through a shortage is to spread that shortage across the biggest base possible. 
because then it becomes manageable. But when I try to take my shortage and offload it onto somebody else, it becomes an unbearable burden. So when we had given them away, guess what we replaced it with? The Regional Conservation Plan. And there was no difference whether you lived in North Las Vegas, Henderson, Las Vegas, or Boulder City. The conservation plan was the conservation plan. The same watering restrictions, the same building restrictions, landscaping restrictions, the same time of day watering, the same buyout program of grass, because we use over 70% of our water outside. And 93% of our water is recycled already. Indoor conservation doesn't do us any good in terms of creating additional resources. The only place it matters is outside. That was the plan that produced the third cut in our water use. And that came first. Taught me a lot of lessons about where our community sensitivities lie around water use. A lot of lessons. I learned never get between someone and their fountain. <laughs> never get between someone, a senior citizen and his car wash. Those are not safe places to live. The fountain's got to stay, but if you wanted your fountain, you had to remove enough grass to equal 50 times the amount of water that that fountain used. So there was a price involved in keeping that fountain. And just for those of you who don't come from Las Vegas, the Las Vegas Strip is not our big user. They use 3% of all of Southern Nevada's water. Their footprint is 3%. And with that, they're the largest employer, the largest economic engine, the largest taxpayer for the entire state of Nevada. That's a pretty darn good investment of water resources. The next challenge, as we looked at our mosaic in 2002, when we were hit with a baseball bat, because we would relied on what the Bureau of Reclamation had told us. I've become allergic to probabilities. The minute somebody talks to me about probabilities, I leave the room. If it's probable, it won't happen. If it's improbable, expect it tomorrow. The probabilities during the 90s while we were talking about surpluses was zero for a drought the magnitude of which happened six months later. Climate change and probabilities don't live on the same planet. Probabilities are created by looking in a rearview mirror. Well, that rearview mirror, given what is happening climatically, does us absolutely no good. It's what's possible. And that's where we have to rely on scientists to help us get our arms around what the climate is going to bring. That's why Kelly Redman is my hero. He doesn't talk to me about probability, but he talks about possibilities. The next was, what do we do on this river system? Lake Mead is dropping like a rock. The old methodology for releasing water from Powell to Mead, the uses on Lake Mead are enormous, and the precipitation isn't there for us to be able to sustain Lake Mead. Now, we have two intakes in Lake Mead. It's our forebay. And we're going to lose that upper intake. But resources came first. Well, if you thought the 90s were fun talking about surpluses, you can imagine the liveliness of the discussions from 2002 to 2007 as we talked about shortages. But you know what? The states kept holding one thing very clear in front of them. Failure was not an option. If we failed, we were going to be headed for a court. A court that the process to even get there was lengthy, while at the same time 
the impacts of the drought were playing themselves out. And all we were doing was giving up our ability to forge our own future. If Some of you have probably heard me say this before, but it is one of those quotes that I live by. Change is coming. George Miller said it to me um, when he was still chairman of natural resources. And he sat me down and he said, Pat, change is coming. You really only have two choices. Do you want to be an architect of that change or do you want to be its tenant? That's really the only choice you have. The states didn't want to be the tenant. Those were very, very difficult political discussions. Just changing Lake Powell's releases to Lake Mead was enormous. Lake Powell was the upper basin's protection. It was built to protect them because they have a delivery obligation of 75 million acre feet over 10 years. If they fail to deliver that, the lower basin makes a call, which means they shut off their users until they've delivered the 75 million. So when Hoover Dam was built, the upper basin said, you have to build Glen Canyon Dam, you have to create Lake Powell as our savings account in order to be able to meet our lower basin deliveries. So you can imagine that the upper basin very jealously guards how quickly water leaves Powell and comes to meet. But we agreed to balance the reservoirs. That was enormous. And in the lower basin, we agreed to take shortages early. We agreed to cuts at 1075, 1050, and 1025. 1025, gotta remember, needs a V. Further you go down in that V, the faster the rate of decline. At the top of Lake Mead, you have about 100,000 acre feet in a foot of Lake Mead. At 1075, you've got 80. It's very different. It's a reservoir that holds 26 million acre feet, has an annual demand of nine and a half. At elevation 1,000, there's less than five million left. So the consequences are enormous. So here it comes full circle. Those conservation measures that we took when Lake Mead hits 1075, no one in Southern Nevada will feel it because we've already cut it back. That's the secret to the future of water management. You want to avoid huge, dramatic, draconian drought measures. You want to move your community on a journey early to when that event you never thought was possible happens they're ready for it. No one's going to feel it at 1075, no one's going to feel it at 1050, and no one's going to feel it at 1025. We've already cut back. And we did that while we added 400,000 people. But what happens below 1025? So in 2007, when we signed that agreement, we sent a letter to the secretary. All seven states signed a letter. That's asked then Secretary Kempthorne to reach out to the State Department and begin discussions with the country of Mexico immediately. There was no way the seven states were going to be able to carry the full burden of severe drought without Mexico's full participation. It took us from 2007 until last November in 2012 to get to minute 319. The very same relationship building, understanding time frame and journey that we went through amongst ourselves as states, we had to go through with Mexico. And for the federal government, it was a really interesting exercise. It was the collision of the treaty clause of the Constitution with the compact clause of the Constitution. 
The United States has sole and exclusive rights to enter into treaties with foreign countries, but they had no water. The Compact Clause prevented them, gave them nothing to sit at the table with. So the federal government had to bring the states to the table. Now the true miracle was that the relationship between the states had so greatly improved that the seven states allowed three people to represent them all. That never would have happened in 1991. Three people represented all seven states and all seven states' interests. That was a huge accomplishment. Minute 319 now brought Mexico to the table. Mexico will take reductions at the same time the lower basin takes reductions at the three elevations I told you about. And we, the United States, will provide them with the ability to store water to buffet against those cuts. They're in the delta. Building reservoirs down there makes little sense. They have very permeable soil. There's no way for them to do groundwater recharge. They live very much like an electric grid. When it comes down, they use it. They now can use Lake Mead as their storage reservoir. We will allow them, the United States and the seven states have said, conservation measures, rotational fallowing, lining of um, canals in Mexico, whatever savings that accrues, you can set, store them in Lake Mead, and then you can use that as your storage bank during a drought. It's the same premise that the, we got in 2007, where the Water Authority, Metropolitan, Central Arizona Project, can engage in extraordinary conservation and can leave that water in Lake Mead. Today, Lake Mead is 10 feet higher than it would normally be due to those um, banking efforts. All the water that we leased and bought on the Muddy and the Virgin River, all the water that were brought in from Coyote Springs has brought Lake Mead back up again. So instead of sitting at around 1120, Lake Mead would be at 1110 today. And since we're walking into, unless there's a miracle in the month of April, the two driest years back to back on the Colorado River, which has never happened before, their historic lows for two years back to back, Mead's going down 13 feet this year. So whatever banking Mexico, ourselves, Met can do this year to buffet against that drop, we're going to do. Them, and begin to systematically put things in place that when it happens, that community can survive, that manager, that municipal water supplier will be the one to cause the first great outmigration. I was thrilled when Bloomberg and Como after Hurricane Sandy stood up and said, it's time to adapt. I went, thank God. You combine rising ocean levels, droughts, extraordinary storm events, and this country is going to change dramatically. Snowfall that now comes as rain, snow that when it falls melts much faster than the infrastructure that we built can handle. Our largest reservoir in the Colorado system is the snowpack that we've become accustomed to melting gradually and gradually feeding the system. It's not that overnight sublimation. It's not that three week runoff. It changes everything fundamentally from the ground up. We need partnerships with scientists, and that's why conferences like this are so important. 
because we who are responsible for managing these resources need climate scientists. We need scientists to help give us the data that we need. I'll never forget asking Jane Luchenko several years ago, well, is the upper basin going to be drier or wetter this year? And she goes, well, there's a 50-50 chance. <laughs> and I said, okay, I could have done that. <laughs> the upper basin is, a do is in the donut hole. It's not in that area that's naturally going to get wetter, and it's not in that area that predictably will get drier. It's the donut hole, which makes it on this river system even more problematic to deal with. So anyone who is Gen Y, or I don't know, millennials haven't made it here yet. Thank God. Um, <laughs> that would mean I'm a whole lot older. Think differently. It's very easy to fight. It's very, very difficult to find collaborative, common pathways that afford everyone the needed protections and everyone the needed survival tools. But there are millions of people in the West that are depending on that ability of that generation to collaborate. So with that, I will say thank you and take any questions you might have. Thank you.